so give us clean hands. So give us clean hands. Give yeah. us pure hearts. Let us, us not lift our souls to it Again, give us. And give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to
with my hands wide open. We're not holding anything. We're not holding anything back. We're giving it all to the Lord God. We're going to climb this mountain of worship. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We give it all to you. We release it all to you right now, Lord Jesus. I will climb. Sing, we give it all to you. We give it all to you, God. Trust in that you that you make something so beautiful out of us. Amen. Out of us. Sing it again. We give it all. Try. 
in that you'll make something beautiful out of us. Hallelujah. Shandaraka, Shandaraka. For the Lord says, I make all things beautiful in my time. Hallelujah, Lord, for you are the God of beauty. You are the God of holiness. You are the God of purity. Yes, Lord Jesus, we trust you with our lives. <laughs> yes, we trust you with our lives. You are a creator. We look to you, the maker of heaven and earth. We look to you, Lord God. I will lift up mine eyes from the hill to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. We give it all to you, God, tonight. We give it all to you. We lay down our own ambitions. We lay down our our own pride, God. We lay down our, our agendas, Lord Jesus. Lord, your word says there is, a, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end thereof is destruction. God, we want to walk in your ways. We don't want to lean on our own understanding, God. We want to walk in your ways. And you are the God that says, behold, I do a new thing. I am the way maker. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. With everything, all things are possible, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus.
want the crowd to sing this woes again. I want us to all yell it. and never hope to be. Thank you, Jesus.
It's our desire that you just have your way here tonight, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for your anointed servant. Lord, your word says, open your mouth and I will fill it. And we know, God, that you have already filled his mouth with your words. And, Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying, God. Thank you, Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Give him praise tonight. You can take a seat. Thank you, praise and worship team. That was awesome. Praise the Lord for his presence. Anybody has a testimony tonight? Something you would like to share? God has done in your life last week, last year, or your testimony. We have a few visitors here tonight. Maybe they would like to share their testimony. Just come right up front. Yeah, just come up front. We'll give you a few minutes. I never used one of these before, but that's all right. I came here eight days ago, and Greg Davis and I were kicking around, coming down to Belize and checking it out on uh, retirement age and he's an evangelist on a campus like, or college campuses and uh, it's just been amazing the contacts that we have made and how God has facilitated us and used uh, uh, facilitated contacts and and 
and made things available for us as we went through the, we've been up north as far as um, uh, Orange Walk and, and we've been in is, uh, all over the, the country here in the eight days and we've been well received and it's been a pleasure to be with uh, Christians here and uh, so we just are overwhelmed by the way God has made things available. Praise God. Doesn't matter where you go, he's always with you. That's that's a good thing. It's not that his his Holy Spirit is limited to a certain spot, whatever. So the same guide you had at home is the same one that's directing you right here. Praise the Lord. Someone else? I have a testimony, it just hasn't happened yet. My back hurts. Would you please pray for it? That's right. A test. What does it say at FTC? You got to have a test to have a testimony, right? Very good. Would you stretch your hand this way? Let's just pray for this guy. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Joshua, this awesome man. We thank you for the faith that you've given to him. Lord, tonight we just speak to that back in the name of Jesus. Lord, you died on the cross for every pain, Lord. And tonight we just ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch him. You are the healer of every sickness. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross, for paying the price, Lord Jesus. And we just speak to his mountain right now in the name of Jesus. Be cast into the sea. Lord, we just thank you that you have promised us where two or three agree in your name. Whatever they shall ask for, it shall happen, Lord. And tonight, Lord Jesus, we are asking and we shall receive. We knock on the door of healing, Lord, and we know you will open it. Lord, we just thank you and we lift you up, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the healing you are doing right now in the name of Jesus, that your name is glorified in our midst, Lord. Lord, you're an awesome God. Thank you for the healing. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Do any different? Anyone else? Just going to little bad. There you go. Have your healing. Anybody else sick? I just want to thank my Lord that he is so good. If his children ask him something, he answers. Sonny, we had company in a village close by our, our, our house. They had a crazy music. Just There was no words. It's like loud music sounds like there was a neighbor to us like there. My head was already so full. It was about half an hour going on, and it was just bouncing in my head already. It was, I get a headache. We have our spiritual conversation there in the kitchen. I, ah, it was so annoying. And I went outside literally and went, is it our neighbors or is, where is it? And it was about half a mile or three-quarter mile off from our house, and it was so loud. I made my way to the washroom, and I said, God, if that's not your music, you will send somebody to shut it off or to make confusion or whatever. And about 10 to 15 minutes, seconds later, it was whatever, and then about 15 minutes later, it was all shut down. I just started thanking Jesus for Basically all night because then we understood in our kitchen what we were talking about without rumbling our head off. Praise the Lord. He knows when it's time to blow the speaker. <laughs> Amen. I just wanted to share what Pastor Dave had about half a year ago. He had a message that really touched me then and it has been with me all the time. He had the, the message he talked about Jericho and the walls when they fell. And he said, um, that is, if we have a battle in our life, the bigger the battle is, once it crumbles, this foundation is stronger than ever. So that's what my faith is on. I'm, I'm looking forward for a beautiful future. Praise the Lord. Yes, according to history, they say the, the wall just sank into the ground. 
they just disappeared. They did not really fall on the people outside. They just went into the ground, and they could walk right over into the city. So God can just remove the walls in our lives, just boom. You walk over it. Praise the Lord. I am very glad for, for the truth and for God and for his word. I was very encouraged today with um, in Psalms 91. It's a very familiar passage, but still I believe it is for today. Um, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And so what is up to me? I completely rejoice, and I'm very happy and glad. That should work too. Um, because I have set my love upon the Lord, I know that he will deliver me. He will set me on high because I have known his name. And the same with the rest of you. He will, when you call upon him, God will answer you. He will be with you in trouble. He will deliver you and honor you because you have set your love upon him and because you have known his name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Someone else? Okay, do we have kids ministry tonight? Oh, one more. Okay. Praise the Lord. I just want to see how many would speak, how many would uh, praise the Lord with the fruit of your lips. And uh, I'm Greg Davis, who uh, Brother Dan was talking about, Bible Greg, uh, known to college students. Uh, my website is BibleGreg.com, but... Uh, so I go to campus ministries and minister full time and, and have come here, but uh, I could see this was coming to a close. I have a Bible verse for you. It says, let us therefore uh, go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Uh, Brother Dan was saying, I wish, you know, it, it, it's probably easier here to minister than it is back home. And I was just encouraging him that, you know, we... Uh, sometimes it, it's easy in here, right, to talk about the Lord. But sometimes when we go out without the camp, it's not so easy. But that's where we're bearing his reproach. So what if they laugh? We have the truth, amen? So, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. So, but if you can't praise the Lord here, if you can't thank the Lord here, and edify, it's for edification of the body. It's not for us standing out. It's not, it's, it's not a matter of us. It's, it's him and edifying one another. And, and he goes on, he says this, he says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. And so, you know, and, and often it, it shouldn't seem like a sacrifice, does it? <laughs> we're, we're praising the Lord and we're thanking him and we get such a blessing out of it. I, I've come here to Belize to bless the country of Belize with the gospel to preach and give out tracts and witness, but yet I'm walking away the best blessing. Uh, if you in your spiritual life are not witnessing to others and you're not going out bearing that reproach, yeah, they'll laugh. Yes, they'll make fun. Yes, they'll be cold, but that's part of bearing his reproach. I mean, he hung up there naked. <laughs> that's, the, that's the truth. They spit in his face. He was mocked. He ripped out his beard, and for us, and for them. And if he can bear that much reproach, can't we just take a laugh or somebody mocking at us? But what I want to get to is we should be offering thanks to him right here. And the Bible says that they became unthankful and their foolish heart was darkened. And so that's the, that's the beginning thing. What does he want? Do you know the cherubims are up there praising the Lord continually? That's, their, that's all they do. <laughs> And that's what we should be doing, continually praising the Lord. And that, that's all part of, you know, when 
uh, brother says, come on up here and share, uh, it's part of giving thanks to him. Going out of your comfort zone and saying, thank you, Jesus, or the Lord did this, or I want to encourage you in that. That's the body working together. See, it's not a matter of a service. A service is a service. The church is the church. And the church can collectively works together to edification of one another. And you might think, I don't have something to share, but you don't know what that might do to touch another brother or sister in here. And it's a blessing just to hear those that came up to share and the word. So I just want to encourage you, share with one another. Talk. I mean, this is an opportunity that, that you don't get in most churches. You don't get a chance to share. Here's your opportunity to come up and thank the Lord. Give him thanks and give him praise for what you've done. And uh, you know, none of us, they say it's the most fearful thing to come up and speak. But uh, that's okay. Perfect love casteth out fear. Amen? All right. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Okay, then we have kids' ministry. Okay, children, will you please come to the front before you're dismissed? We want to see you and we want to bless you. There we go. Make room. Let's make room. Awesome. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, will you please stretch your hands this way. Let's just bless this generation. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these beautiful kids. We just speak your protection upon them. We just speak your Holy Spirit in them. Lord, we just thank you for their lives. And we just speak a great future in them. Lord, give them understanding of your word. Help them to receive you and that you would dwell in their lives, Lord. Lord, that your fountain of life would bubble over out of their belly, Lord, and that they, w- they would become uh, rivers of living water in them, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for their teachers. Bless them tonight. Give them wisdom. And may your Holy Spirit and your peace be in that room. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, you're dismissed. Okay, the time is yours, Pastor. David, who's teaching tonight? I don't know. David, okay, time is yours. Hallelujah. We are waking up. Hallelujah. We, last week, there about when we were having prayer meeting, we were able to hear a little bit on the, how we can make use of our tongue and the importance of our tongue in making delivery of God's inheritance into our lives. And we realized, we also heard that there was a woman, a widow, that came to the prophets. And she was asking, telling the prophet, that the creditors have come to take all of my children because my husband, the prophet, died and they was owing some debt. And the prophets hacked what do you have in your, in your house? There is no one bound to this world empty, though you came empty. 
we need to understand that. Though you came empty, there was no cloth when you were born, yet God has embedded some grace, gift, on the inside of you. But tonight, we're going to see in a new dimension of how important our mouth is. Your mouth, or your life, I should say, is at the mercy of your mouth. Your life, your life is at the mercy of your mouth, of your tongue. Proverbs says, chapter 18, verse 21, death and life are in the power of tongue, and which, whichever way, which one do you like most, you are going to reap it, death and life. And remember that God says, behold, I place before you death and life. But God encourages us to choose life so that we may live. Your mouth has an important part to make your life beautiful, colorful. But we're going to see tonight, every individual person is faced with one king or the other. There is a king in the life of God's children that says you will not go. There is a king in the life of God's children that says you're not going to enter into your inheritance. And those are the kings we want to deal with tonight. Because freedom is your possession. Freedom is your inheritance. The people said, or God, God said to them, God answered Israel in the wilderness. As we are entering Kadesbani, he said, just exactly that I've heard you said in my ear, that exactly will I do for you. God himself said, what you said, that is exactly what I would do for you. There is no question whether you have a king standing before you. The question is, how do you respond to the king that is standing before you? Our response comes through what we believe and what we declare. And Father, we thank you tonight. We ask for your grace to be imparted to everyone. We ask for your presence in every sense. We know you are here already. There's no doubt about it. We ask for the manifestation of your presence in our midst tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, sweet Holy Spirit, go with us in this world of life. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. I quickly want to read a... Uh, uh, a passage for us in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 and from verse 8. Daniel chapter 3 verse 8. It says, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, herp, Sackbut, sultry, and dusimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth now down and worshipeth, that it should be cast into the midst of a burning fierce furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of the Babylonian, Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar speak and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, and music, you fall down and worship the image we have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast into the same hour, into the midst of a burning fury furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? 
You see, when the mortal began to challenge the immortal God, there used to be chaos. There used to be conflict. When man begins to challenge God in your life, when a king begins to challenge God in your life, tonight is a fighting lie, lie, I mean night, because I'm glad that the devil is not happy that we are here. I'm glad he's not happy. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We are not careful. If be so, our God whom we will serve is able to deliver us from the burning fierce furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should hit the furnace one seven times, more than before. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning furnace. Intimidation. Then these men were bound in their clothes, their chosen horses, and their heel hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fairy furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That is what is happening to your enemy tonight. The psalmist says, for the same net that they prepared for me, they themselves have entered into it. That is what is happening to you tonight. Therefore, and these three men, verse 23, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Then they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lord, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Who told him that the Son of God in there? Who told him? The word said in Isaiah 43, verse 2, that when thou passest through the fire, I will be with you. I will not allow the flame to kindle against you. That is what happened here. But we've got to believe. If it ever happened, then it can happen now. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, power has changed hand. Power has changed hand. Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the, the princes, governors, and captains, and the king counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power because he promised, I will be with you. He said, Lo, I will be with you even to the close of the age. No matter what you are passing through now, God is with you. And if God, if be, if God be for you, then who can be against you? There is a king to challenge in your life tonight. And the prison, okay, verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar speak and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, the same God he was challenging. Your story must turn to testimony tonight. I say your story, what you are passing through, the oppression, the affliction, must turn to testimony tonight. Because you're going to say God in another dimension. He said, who has sent his angel and delivered the servant that trusted in him and have chained the king's sword, the king, the king's sword, 
and yielded their body that they might not serve nor worship and God nor worship any god except the, their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language will speak anything against the god of Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego shall be cut into pieces, and their houses shall be made a dungeon hill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Promotion is coming your way. I declare promotion is coming your way. After this night meeting, your experience will be a bountiful testimony because people are coming around about, um, with you to dance around about you, to dance with you, to rejoice with you because of what God is doing in your life. The, my message tonight says, changing the king's word. Changing the king's word. Changing the king's word. Like I mentioned earlier, your mouth is the determinant as how far you can go in life, as how far you can enjoy life better, your, your, your mouth. In the program of God, your mouth is very, very important. And that is why it says, just exact way I, I've, I've heard you said in my ear, he said, that is the exact thing I would do for you. And you remember, unfortunately, they couldn't enter the land because of mouth. They couldn't possess their possession because of their mouth. Many people, many Christians couldn't obtain the inheritances because of their mouth. Because what they see is what they say. God didn't see nothing before he declared. And when he declared, he said, behold, they are very good. When God made you, he said, you are very good. Whatever king that constitutes hindrances to your blessing, tonight the hand has come to them in Jesus' name. As we know that trying to change a king's word is to dare the authority behind the sword. These people dared the authority behind the sword. Oh, ye king, we care not of what you are saying. We care not of the threat, the intimidation. We don't mind. Because we know that the God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And I've, ever, I've never had one that people who declare the integrity of God's word, to that extent, they never get hurt. We remember Esther. Esther said, I know it's not the right time for me to go in to see the king. If I perish, I perish. Determination. When you, when you are lost out for God, and you believe that there is nothing God cannot do for you, you put your trust in him because he said, those who put their trust in the Lord, they shall be as Mount Zion. They cannot be removed. When we put our trust in the Lord, then the evidence is true. Then we begin to see the testimony of his goodness in our life. Who constitutes a king in a man's life? You have to understand that anything, anyone could be that king in your life. Anybody could be that very king in your life. Anything can be that very king in your life. It could be a man. It could be a sickness. It could be debt. It could be anything, any unfortunate thing. And sometimes it could be your parents. Maybe your parents have declared a particular word to your life and it's very hurting and has caused depression and oppression in your life. But I tell you, you can change the king's word tonight. You can change that word tonight because God began to do a new thing in your life. There, there's this man called Ben Carson. He's a, a medical doctor. I think he's a, a cardiologist. When he was in school, nobody ever knew he would become anything. 
They called him non-entity. He said he could not achieve a month to nothing. The teacher wouldn't embrace the destiny of God in his life. This man couldn't believe. Only his grandmom began to speak the word of life, changing the king's word in his life. And this man became the greatest cardiologist in the world, in the entire world. There is nothing God has said you will be that you cannot be. Your mouth will determine that. It's enough of declaring what you see. It is enough of declaring the negative that surrounds you. It's time to start declaring the word of God. When you declare the word of God, then you begin to see the evidence of the word of God. But that should be by faith. Because he said, if you have to come to God, you have to believe that he is, and he is faithful to reward those who diligently seek him. Because by faith, without faith, you cannot please him. Tonight, your faith will make what, whether you please God or you don't please God. Your faith in his word. No matter what you may be seeing, no matter the challenges, your faith in the living God will deliver you tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ. Words are spiritual things that when they clear, resort to physical evidences. Words. We don't care many times. We name our children any, anyway. We name them anything that we like. We name them stone. No wonder they have become stone-hearted. Uh, hearted. We name them whatever. Names are very important because words are spiritual. And when you speak into the life of a man, it becomes what he carries all the way, all through his life. We remember Jabez. The mom said, because it wasn't easier for me when I gave back to, her, to him. So I would rather call him the way I saw it. And that was how Jabez lived through most of his, most of his life. Not until he stood one day and realized that I cannot continue with this name because the name is spiritual and, and they are pursuing him and pushing him to the wall all the time. No breakthrough. But he called, the Bible said, and Jabez called on the name of the Lord and God answered him. And God changed the story. God is changing your story tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. I said words are spiritual that when they clear results to physical evidences. There is a gate to every kingdom. And it's, a, it's the authority that goes along with its throne. There is a gate to every kingdom. Gate in the Bible signifies authority. You need to break through the gate before you can enter into your inheritances. Without contention, there is no possession. You need to contend tonight. You need to fight tonight. Knowing fully that the fight we are fighting, we are fighting in victory, not for victory, because we have the victory already on the cross of Calvary. You have to be settled with that confidence in your heart that when you fight, you are fighting with God, and you are fighting in victory because you already have possessed the victory. Gate is the significance of authority, and it takes violence to have access to it and to possess it. I'm not seeing any gentleman at the war front. Even if you have been gentle before, you change your style when you get to the war front. Many times we live so gentle that we allow the oppressors to continue to oppress us. Tonight, there must be a change, for power must change hands. No possession, no content. I mean, no contention, no possession. No, no, possession. The Bible says in Psalm 24, lift up your head, O ye gates, for the king of glory must come. For you to enter into inheritance, the gates must be lifted up. The gates, the authority of hell, must be subdued before you. It says, say unto God, how terrible art thou in your works, but through the greatness of your power, so shall your enemies submit themselves. Through the greatness of God's power. As I said, you are not fighting alone tonight because God is on your side. And so the enemy must bow. It's a command, and God is saying to us that we will have to speak with the enemies in the gate to enter into our inheritances. Healing is our inheritance, prosperity is your inheritance. 
God is not blessing you with poverty. There's no poverty. There's no blessing in poverty. I'm not saying if you are poor, you have committed a sin. You have not. You may decide to live that way if you want. But I've determined I'm not going to live poor. And I say, fruitfulness is your inheritance. Good and godly success is your birthright. Your mouth is the principal determinant to either receive and live out or lose it. In other sense, your life is at the mercy of your tongue. You have to declare tonight life instead of death. Even if the doctor says it's all over, that the case is closed, you can change the king's word. That doctor is that king in your life at that time. You can change it. You can say, no, God didn't promise me death. He said, I shall live to declare the good, the goodness of the Lord in the land. That must be your song tonight. Your mouth is the principal determinant to hear and receive and live out God's blessing in your life. For your mouth is what controls or influences what happens to you. Your mouth. My mouth. Your mouth. My mouth controls and influences what happens to me. You could decide tonight that you, could, you would change the king's word. And that is what you're going to experience. Because we saw that in the life of Meshach and Abednego and Shadrach. They changed the king's word that the challenge of the king, the intimidation of the king, have become a testimony in the life of these three men. That must be your portion. In the name of Jesus. God says in number 1428, as truly as I live, see the Lord. God himself is speaking here. As truly as I live, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. What will you want God to do to you tonight? It's a choice. I place before you death and life, but I encourage you, choose life so that you may live. That is God speaking. We will possess the land if only we will contend. We will possess if only we will contend. When God was done testing Abraham in Genesis 2, 27, 22, 7, he declared to him that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee. Thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and the, the sand which is upon the sea, sure, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemy. To possess the gates of the enemy, it doesn't take gentility. You don't have to be gentle. You cannot be gentle to possess the gates of your enemy because the enemy wouldn't let you go. You need to fight. You need to contend. The weapon of our warfare is not kind. We have to understand when I say contention. Because many times when we say we have to fight, then we look at a brother who has offended you in the church and say, yeah, yes, I have to fight him. No, no, I'm not saying that to you. We are talking about the spiritual power, the rulers of darkness in this world, the principalities and power. And those are the way one we are addressing tonight. Those are the kings that are standing in your way. They must be subdued tonight. But you've got to talk. You've got to say. When you say, you will see. When you see, they will be able to say with God, it is very good. My life has changed. And Genesis 24, 60, verse 60 says, And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands and millions, of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. He's not talking about folding hands there. He's talking about fight. And remember, he's talking to a lady, a, a damsel here, Rebecca. Let your seed, it's a command, let your seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And verse 127 says, Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed at the gates, but they need to speak. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. If you must change your situation, you must be ready to fight. And when I say fight, you need to speak. Not boxing one another around with words or with, uh, with hands or with uh, frowning eyes or faces or 
with backbiting, or with all those stuffs. That's not what we're talking about. When we're talking uh, about contention, we're talking about fighting spiritual warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down. You've got to use your mouth to pull down tonight. There is a structure before you heard in the, the song, uh, we, we heard in the testimony about how the Lord brought down the, uh, uh, what is it? Jericho, the wall of Jericho. They didn't close their mouth. A closed mouth is a closed destiny. A closed mouth is a closed destiny. We don't see much of God in our life because we, we are, we too, I mean, truly close our mouth often. We don't speak. We don't speak. God has us in his cuba and it enables us to fight in victory. If we must win, we will fight together with the enemy and then we shall win. The family that prays together, they stay together. If you don't pray together, you fall apart. There are many ways men or marriages fall apart. An husband and a wife may be sleeping on the same bed but they are falling apart already. It's not bodily touch all the time alone. It's your heart. Hallelujah. This is how we should fight. You see, this is how we should be in the quiver. This is God's quiver. We see many, many arrows in that quiver. That is how the church should be. We should be in the quiver. Quiver is a, 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 a kind of purse that stores our arrows. So we are the arrows in the hand of God. But we need to stay together if we must fight and win. God's word declared takes violence to access and possess the kingdom of heaven. Because since the day of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and only the gentle, no, only the violent takes it by force. If you are too slow, somebody will override or overtake you. Many times in prayer, we are, we are too slow. We surrender too easily to the enemy. We sleep too much. Jesus says, when man slept, the enemy came. If you go to bed now and you sleep, you don't know who enters your house sometimes. You don't know who walks around your premises sometimes. Because you sleep too much. You remember the story of those two harlots. They were sleeping. And one was so smart. When she slept on her own child, the child died, and she crept like, like Satan. She, she crept in softly to the other lady and took. I don't know how that lady could be sleeping for somebody to, to take away his son from, from her. And she put the dead one there. Because when men slept, the enemy came and he changed the glory of God. He changed the blessing of God. He changed health and he put sickness there. When men slept, let's wake up. It's time for revival. What can Pharaoh meant to Israel was a hard, harsh bondage. It is the same authority and power that will not let any child of God possess what belongs to him that the enemy has in his custody. No freedom is ever cheap to have. No freedom is ever cheap. Ask from, uh, ask the American, ask the, the British, ask the Spanish, ask every nation. You see that freedom is not cheap. And I've never seen any Christian who got the freedom so cheap. I know you are saved. But you may be saved and still faces on oppression. And it's not the mind of God for you. You go to heaven. Like Lazarus. It's good to go to heaven. But I don't want to go like Lazarus. You remember Lazarus and the, the rich man? Because you are poor doesn't necessarily mean that you, you will go to hell. You may go to heaven. But you not enjoy this world. And that's not the mind of God for you. When he saved you, he paid for healing too. When he saved you, he paid for your deliverance. 
When he saved you, he paid for your prosperity because he said uh, he became poor that you, through his poverty, might become rich. I don't know where you get the word poverty then, that it's good to be poor so that we can go to heaven. It doesn't necessarily mean that if, when you are poor, you go to heaven. It may be an hindrance to you. Because I've seen some people being poor and they, they go and steal, they go and do all sorts of crime and eventually when they are caught, probably they died. Are you saying they are going to heaven? No. To take over, you have to overtake. And to recover all, you have to pursue in righteousness. Just as David did. To take over your possession, you have to overtake. And to overtake is not easy. You, know, you don't sit down to overtake. You fight to overtake. Then you recover all. So you will recover all in Jesus' name. What King Nebuchadnezzar was to Daniel and the other three Hebrews was obstruction to their relationship with God. He wanted to have them take their focus from the living God to a man God. To us today, it's still happening. What King Hebab and his wife Jezebel meant to Nebot was a forceful overtaking of a man's possession, an eventual murder. First, first King 21, this is the same power that watches a man succeeding and never allows him to enjoy the labor of his hand. There are powers like that. There are kings like that. They will allow you. You will work. You will get paid. You will get profit. But you won't enjoy it. It must not be your portion in Jesus' name. That's a king. That's a king. How come you get all the profits and you take it to Mexico to see the doctors? Is that the will of God for you? No. No. We need to change our mind tonight. But changing your mind means changing what you say. Without contention, there can never be any possession. And to rise to a new dimension, you will have to confront the enemy in the gate and then place a demand on what God has designed for you. You need to place a demand intentionally, radically. Place a demand on what God has for you. Without placing a demand, the enemy will still keep you bound and keep your possession in his custody. But that's not the mind of God for you. We need to change our attitude to prayer. The patriarchs of hold could not possess their land without contending with the enemies in the gates. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have stories to tell us that it took fighting. You need a fighting spirit tonight to possess what belongs to you. The prophet of old did not find cheap possession either, except they spoke with the enemy in the gate. The saints are not without, with exception either. Possession, possession of inheritance demand that they contend for them. Even the saint, we, the saint. We talk about the prophet and the patriarch. But we, the sin, we need to have the fighting spirit too. In the entire scripture, no historical miraculous landmark was ever recorded without a thorough contention against the enemy. No landmark, no, no historical blessings. You think of Abraham, think of Jacob, think of Isaac. Everyone has to fight through, to break through. You don't break through without fighting. You don't see that, ex ex I mean, ex uh, expecting the, the world to fall down. No. God has them. Move around. Move around and speak. Shout. Restoration is never a product of retirement, but rather, rather to fight to possess destiny. And when they, they when, uh, then leave a legacy for the next unborn generation, when we need restoration, we don't sit down retiring. We need to press forward to fight. We got to Cuba some, sometimes in the 2008, and the, the enemy said, no, you will not go. We were coming to, God told me in August 17, 2007, to come to Belize, say, it's time for, for mission in Belize. And coming, the, the king of, the prince of Persia, which stood me, just like he did to Daniel, who stood me in Cuba, and he said, you will not go. I said, you're a liar. He set up some, some ladies and the men said, no, you will not go. You can't. And that's the only flight in a month. 
and we have exceeded, we've, we've used, expended all the money we had on, on us. We stayed two weeks instead of three days in Cuba. But we didn't give up. We addressed the, the situation and we were piloted into the, into the aircraft, the gates. And when, when I got to Belize, too, the gate says, You can't enter. Because I came to Belize with $50 with my wife and because we, we spent all the money in Cuba. We had like $10,000 US dollar that we were bringing up. We spent everything in Cuba. Hotel, everything. Because you are not allowed to stay with anybody in Cuba. You have to be a rent an hotel. The gates. A pastor that was coming also, he had to leave to get back to I mean, He had to go back home from Cuba. He couldn't come to Belize. Because you are a pastor doesn't mean that you have, uh, you have all it takes to possess your possession. Taking your possession belongs to every Christian. So the lady said, my boy is coming to deal with you because you don't, we couldn't, my wife said, don't write anything because how could you come with your family and write $50, 50 US dollars to live in Belize? When you are not, you are not just visiting, you are staying. And the heaven walked in house and they have to send to their director in, Bel in Belmopan and the director gave them another. I was uh, about six months in Belize. I, well, you're American, you don't know anything about uh, visa. When they say American visa, you don't know it is more than gold. Oh, you don't know. You are just enjoying. You don't know. You are, you just, you, you are free. You go to anywhere in the world you go, you like. Not with other countries. Oh, she experienced that? Maybe not like, maybe not like me. <laughs> they said, you are just six months in Belize. No papers, no documents, no nothing. How could you apply for visa? Because we wanted to bring the other children. And we, we didn't want to go through Cuba again. We said the easier, the cheapest way to go is to go through U.S. And the guy said, no, you can't. You can. He uses people to discourage us, including anybody over there. He said, no, you, you are just wasting your time, wasting your money. I said, okay. And in fact, when I went for the visa, the man denied me. He said, no. And I came out, my wife saw me, he said, what happened? I said, fine. <laughs> I said, fine. We got to the base. Why well, and then? The director and his wife saw me and said, oh, because he saw my face. Your countenance is important when you are fighting with the enemy. He saw my face, radiant, loving, rejoicing. He said, wow, praise the Lord. They gave him. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> I said, where is this? He's coming. And uh, the heaven arranged it again. He has to I mean, use a, a senator in the U.S., and the senator has to send to me and send to the embassy and give him. You need to fight. You need to fight for your possession. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been in Belize. I probably wouldn't have, of course, wouldn't have known you. How would I? Except I see you in the spirit in your dream. The same man that I saw four years before we came, God gave me a vision. Exactly what happened. He said, you, you, you are not qualified. How, what, what can you tell me? How, I mean, what can you prepare or give me to make me give you the visa? I said, no, you are not. You don't have any paper. And I didn't have no paper in that revelation. And I met him again and he said, okay, I will give you. The, oh, the same man, the same man, the same man, the Lord made me to recall, the same man I saw in the embassy here, the same man I saw four years then. I said, I can't give you you don't have any paper, no residency, no nothing. And he has to call me back. We're talking of facing authority. I could have said, well, I mean, that's okay. We need to fight. I don't know what that king is before you. It could be sickness. It could be lack. It could be debt. It could be one struggle or the other. It could be depression. He's a king. He must submit tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. It all depends on whose hand this sling falls. It all depends. You have what it takes. It all depends on how you handle the sling. It all depends. David was a man. He saw Goliath. And he took all of sling and stone. He said, I'm going to get you down. A small boy. Without huge man, how huge is your Goliath? 
It depends on whose hand the sling falls. It depends. David had a sling to bring down the head of Goliath in his life and filled Goliath with the carcass, with the, with the, fill his carcass with the, with the, with the birds of, of the hair and with the beasts of the feet. It all depends on whose, whose hand the sling falls. And to another boy, it could be David, like me. To another man, it could be David, like me. And say, what sling means could be just to bring down a fowl, even for the enemy to be fed. Some people are just feeding their enemies. It's not the mind of God for you, for it depends on whose hand the sling falls. The sling in your hand, what are you doing? It? doing I mean, doing to it or with it? He said, oh, fill this valley. There was a valley. The Philistines stayed on the mountain. And uh, David, on, on the, I mean, David and the, the troop, Israel, stood on another mountain, and there was a valley between them. He didn't care. They brought down the enemy into the valley. To level the valley with your mountain, it is contention. The valley before you, to level it, so that you could walk into your inheritance, it takes contention, fighting with the, the spirit world. You need to contend tonight and declare whatsoever that constitutes hindrance in my life, you must submit. I must walk on my mountain and it must become a stepping stone to my miracle tonight. For it depends on whose hand the sling falls. Depression unfruitfulness, sickness of all kinds, afflictions, you can overcome it because it depends on whose sling, whose hand the sling falls. Collapse in business, indecent character, bad habits, it must leave you now for it depends on whose hand the sling falls tonight. What are you doing with the sling in your hand? To kill your Goliath and feed his body and carcass that the, the fowl of the, the, the here may hit, or you just kill a fowl. Killing a fowl is so simple. Anybody can kill a fowl. Joshua, you can kill a fowl. But it takes a David heart to kill a Goliath, for it depends on whose hand the sling falls. Mark 11, 2, 26, and joins us to have faith in God. You bring down your mountains to level the valley before you, and it shall be to you the stepping stone to your miracle. Believe that you receive, Jesus said, and you shall have it. Now that you stand in prayer, another thing you have to know, when you stand in prayer, it says, forgive. Without it, your prayer will not go nowhere. Have you, have you ever, or you have never experienced when you are praying, and it looks that the, the seal is just like that, and the prayer is not going anywhere, and it's coming down to you, just like David said. He said, my prayer returned unto me. It depends on whose hand the slain falls. Your Goliath must be brought down into the valley tonight, for the fowls of the here are waiting in hunger. They are hungry for your Goliath. Or is your Goliath hungry for your fowl? For it all depends on whose hands the slain falls. You have a sling in your hand. It depends on how you handle it. It depends on your target. First Samuel, I will soon round up, please. God's word says, 17, verse 3, verse 40, verse 46. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. That is the challenge, the action. And he, David, took his staff in his hand and chose him five small stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had. Even the script and his sling was in his hand. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Are you drawing nigh to your Philistine, to the king before you, or are you drawing back, backward? Because you are afraid, because of fear. Fear has turmoil, torment, the Bible says. For it all depends on whose hand the sling falls. Declaration. This day, just like you would declare tonight. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the hare, 
and to the wild bees of the herd, that all the herd may know that there is a God in Israel. The question is, why do we fight? Must we fight to glory or to glorify God? Must we fight to glory or to glorify God? That's a, they, they are different, two different things. To fight to glory, oh, I want to be seen, I want to be noticed, I want to be known. Oh, let me fight. Or I want to glorify God, like David did. But it depends on whose hand a sling falls. A sling in the hand of David is a weapon. We can see how the sling looks like here. It depends on whose hand. I don't know if this, if this is your hand. It depends on whose hand the sling falls. And it depends on how you handle your sling to bring down your Goliath. Tonight, your Goliath must come down. He must be brought down. Not to rise up again in Jesus' name. Amen. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. The scepter is authority in the hand of King Azuros. is an instrument of favor for the deliverance of Israel. But in the hand of King Ahab and Jezebel, the scepter it was a weapon of hatred, first full of taking of the righteous possessions and eventual murder of the righteous one. For it all depends on whose hand the sling falls. The sling in the hand of uh, King Azuros was used to bless God to bring salvation to Israel. But in the hand of Jezebel, and, his, and her husband, it was destruction, intimidation. But it depends on whose hand the sling falls. The birth of the king in a manger was a divine exploit for the redemption of mankind. The, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Divine exploit to bring God to the saving grace. But to King Pharaoh, it was intimidation, oppression to the, ch the children of Israel. For it depends on whose hand the sling falls. What is it that makes the word of your mouth powerful? I want us to take note of this. What is, what is those things or those things that make the word of your mouth powerful? Because it said, death and life are in the power of tongue. Death and life. Death, death, death and life are in the power of tongue. What makes it to be effective? It is considered a seed, number one, in Jesus' parable. The parable that our Lord Jesus made, it is considered, your word is considered a seed. When a farmer, we are in a community of farmers, when a farmer sows, when he plants, he expects harvest. So we plant seed, the word, and whatever we plant, we reap. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be deceived. You don't plant mango and expect orange. For whatsoever a man saw, that exactly he will reap. For it depends on whose hand the slain falls. Number two, angels are reckoned with our command. Angels of God, they are reckoned with our command. They are waiting to listen, to hear you and act. What are you saying before your angels? And every, every person has a guardian angel, everyone, everyone, including your little, little child that God gave back today, has a, his own uh, guardian angel. Everyone we speak, we speak is a command to the angelic word, negative or positive. Angel cannot help to convert your statement. You have to know that. It will not help you to convert your statement or reframe or restructure your sentence. Angels are not having time to do that. They are not commanded to do that. What they do is to operate them verbatim, they operate on what you say, exact thing you say. Truly, as truly as I live, as I've heard him and hear, that exactly I will do. Angels are ministering spirit. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. And in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 6, it says, Sober not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Don't make that mistake. When you're expecting positive, don't make the mistake of declaring negative because that's what the angels will do. They are waiting on your word. They are waiting. And it says, Wherefore should God be hungry at thy voice? Because if you are saying something negative to God's voice, to God's word, 
How do, how do you expect God to be pleased with you? He said, and destroy the work of your hand. No, God forbid. What your mouth allows is what, your de is what determines how you will go in life. What your mouth allows is what determines how far you go in life. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1, we see the angelic conflict on Joshua's destinies. Satan was standing, Joshua was standing, the angels were standing, and God was there, and the, the accuser of our brethren was challenging Joshua, was challenging the authority of God in the life of Joshua. And God had to command Satan to keep off, and the chain, the rope, fill the rag that was upon Joshua, the high priest, and they put a new rope. You have that rope of righteousness, because the Bible says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have a new rope. So what you are doing is that you are fighting in righteousness when you fight in faith. Zechariah 3.1, yeah. And I pray a command tonight in Jesus' name that whatever that tries to resist your advancement, whatever that tries to resist your healing, whatsoever that tries to resist your restoration, must die tonight in the name of Jesus. You belong to God. You belong to the household of, household of faith. And that faith will work for you tonight. Psalm 103 verse 20 and Psalm 91 verse 11. The angel hark to the voice of God's word. Number three, we said number one, it is your word is considered a seed, Jesus said. Number two, angels are reckoned with your command, with what you say. Number three, commit the integrity of God's word. Commit the integrity of God's word. Jesus never had time to argue with the devil. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. But you've got to know what is written before you are able to declare it. If you don't know it is written that Jesus paid for your sickness, then you say, oh, well, God is teaching me. He's training me. God, are you, you are a father. Are you training your, your child with his sickness or with disease? Are you going to do that? No. No. And if you, being evil, knows how to give good gift to your children, how much more your heavenly father? For it all depends on whose hand the sling falls. So commit the integrity of God's word. That's Isaiah 44, 24, 26. God is committed to whatever we confess. God is committed to perform his word. God does not lie. Number chapter 3, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. He won't turn back and say, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean what I said. No. No. Once he said it, he meant it. And he will do it tonight. Let's stand up in agreement. So commit yourself to the integrity of God's word. The Bible says, and they went everywhere preaching, and God was confirming the word with signs and wonders. Acts chapter 14, verse 3. The host of darkness wanted to pollute the destiny of Joshua, but God arose and spoke and overturned them in their scheme. Proclamation enhances delivery. You need to proclaim tonight. What you proclaim will enhance your delivery into your inheritance. No declaration, no, no proclamation, no contention, no possession. You've got to possess your possession tonight. Amen. Whatever that was not found in Jesus Christ that is still traceable to your life must give way tonight because he paid for them, for them all. Hallelujah. 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 Alleluia. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Restoration, come on, restoration, God. Yes, Lord. Restoration, come on, restoration, God. Come on, push through promotion. I don't know what you are going through. I don't know what constitutes that king before you. Is it King Nebuchadnezzar that constituted oppression, hardship to Israel? Is it King Ahab and, and uh, Queen Jezebel that constituted intimidation and forcefully possessing what belongs to you? You must fight tonight and take back what belongs to you. God told uh, uh, David, he said, yes, pursue. 
When you pursue, you will overtake. And when you overtake, you will recover all. Tonight is a night to pursue. You must pursue. You must contend with the enemy. When you pursue, you will overtake. Because you are not fighting the battle by yourself. God is on your side. Hallelujah.